Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 25 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me as always is my co-host Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Uh, good to be here, and uh, welcome back to our listeners. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our last episode. Uh, I know we had a good time chatting with uh, Maysoon. Um, I know more recently, I, I know Maysoon talked about some of her upcoming, uh, the upcoming comedy tour that they've been doing, or the comedy show. Uh, they, they, it had many of our uh, past Ooh. guests, so I thought it was kind of cool, uh, because Azar is involved with that, uh, Azar Usman, as well as uh, Dean Obeidullah. Yes. Uh, we're very excited to be joined this episode by Dr. Ibrahim Musa. Dr. Dr. Musa is a professor of Islamic studies at the University of Notre Dame with appointments in the Department of History and the Kroc Institute for International Studies in the Kiev School of Global Affairs. His interests span both classical and modern Islamic thought with a special focus on Islamic law, history, ethics, and theology. His new book, What is a Madrasa? Uh, it was published in early 2015 by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, Dr. Musa is author of Ghazali and the Poetics of Imagination, winner of the American Academy of Religions' best first book in the history of religions, uh, and that's from 2006. And he's also editor of the last manuscript of the late Professor Fazl Rahman, Revival and Reform in Islam, a Study of Islamic Fundamentalism. He was named Carnegie Scholar in 2005 to pursue research on the madrasas, Islamic seminaries of South Asia. Dr. Musa, thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for having me. I'm delighted to uh, talk both to you, Zaki, and to Pavez Ahmed. Well, we, we've been wanting to have you on for a long time, and there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world that we know uh, we can benefit just by having a conversation about it with you. So, so this is definitely uh, something uh, we're, we're very excited about. So, My pleasure. Yeah. So I, I guess, uh, you know, before we delve into some of the stuff that Zaki was talking about, um, Dr. Musa, if you could, um, uh, I guess for, for for the listeners, I, I should make it uh, make it clear that uh, Dr. Musa is an old friend of a former guest of ours, uh, my teacher, uh, Dr. Munir, Munir Farid. And so you also hail from South Africa. Yes, indeed, um, Dr. Munir Farid and I we we go back. Uh, our acquaintance was not in South Africa, but as fellow South Africans, we met up in India. Uh, when both of us were uh, students at seminaries in India, I was at the Nadwatul Ulama in the city of Lucknow in Uttar Pradesh, and he visited me there, and he was at uh, the Darul Uloom Dioban in India, where he finished his degree. So, uh, And we have been, I would say, and I can proudly say, lifelong friends. So <laughs> an amazing friendship uh, over several decades. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, no, he, he's, yeah, he, he shares the same sentiments. And uh, like I said, I, I've never had the pleasure of meeting you, but uh, heard so much about you through him. Um, so uh, take us back a little bit to South Africa. I know, you know, we actually uncovered a lot with Dr. Farid in terms of talking about the presence of the, um, of the Indian Muslim community specifically in South Africa. Um, I imagine your sort of familial roots, roots excuse me, are, are very similar to Dr. Farid's in that your, your forefathers had, had migrated to South Africa? Yes, uh, my great-grandfather came uh, from Western India, that is the area of Gujarat, as a peasant to sell some, some, sold some land and made his way and made a passage to Africa and settled in the city of Cape Town where he uh, flourished as a, um, a fruit vendor and later on specialized in uh, uh, you know, wholesale uh, selling fruit. And, uh, and so I am sec third generation uh, after him, South African. Um, and uh, Although my, my grandfather was born in India but came to South Africa at a very young age. I see. And so was he also in the sort of business, uh, you know, merchant cl class? Merchant class. And, uh, you know, my generation, at least in our family, uh, I broke the family tradition by breaking away from, uh, from uh, you know, the merchant, <laughs> merchant class and started trading in ideas. So, uh, <laughs> right. so I hope that it's a decent break. <laughs> I, I didn't become an engineer, so I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, but uh, so, you know, I remember when we spoke with Dr. Farid, he kind of mentioned uh, the fact that a lot of the, uh, you know, Indian Muslims that had, had come to South Africa were either 
um, you know, part of that sort of, you know, business com commerce class or um, in emergence or, or I guess religious scholars to serve the needs of that sort of burgeoning Muslim community in South Africa. Um, and so, you know, did you, while you were growing up in South Africa, did you ever go back to India, visit when you were a young child? No, um, my mother was uh, uh, born and raised in India and she came as a a young bride to South Africa and only had about two or three trips back to back to India. So our focus uh, as as a, as a family uh, was largely, you know, basically establishing our our lives in South in, in South Africa. India didn't have much attraction for any of my other siblings, and uh, I my only connection to India was when I had my own kind of you know spiritual and religious awakening. And I started thinking about who I am and what I am and trying to make sense of, of my own kind of religious identity. Uh, only then did India come into the picture. And when that happened, too, uh, my family had great trepidation about, you know, why am I going back to India? India is a place that they in those days thought that they go, they, they're trading up by going to Africa and leaving India behind. And here is this kid, uh, the eldest uh, of six, um, deciding to go back to India and is not only going for two or three months, but is planning to stay there for six years. So it came as quite a, quite a shock to my family. And they thought that, you know, and I would, you know, not, you know, if I didn't want to uh, follow the family tradition of going into business, at least I would have some kind of profession. And the very kind of career choice, or I wouldn't say career choice, but the kind of uh, passion that I was following was about religion. And the kind of outcome that they had uh, when they saw someone studying religion, they thought that the person who's going to graduate from there is going to become a cleric. And, and, and a cleric for them was somebody who uh, would be largely dependent on the, on the support of the community. And they did not see that as a kind of a meaningful and viable uh, possibility for me. So it took a lot of con convincing, especially uh, to convince my father that it's a, it's a good idea for me to go, go to India and, and study, uh, study Islam. You know, uh, wow. Yeah. And, and I know we'll definitely get into that and, and talk about that because that, I mean, that's a fascinating part of what I do want to talk to you about. Um, real quick though, and I, I know this was some of the things that, you know, one of the things we didn't really get to do, to talk about in, in great detail with Dr. Farid, and that is, you know, how, where, where did the, where did the Indian Muslim community fit in, in, in this sort of, uh, in, in the sort of segregation model, which at that time was obviously, you know, de, de facto segregation, uh, you know, by way of apartheid in South Africa. Well, I, I know we get a little bit of that for those who've seen the movie Gandhi, but you know, I imagine Gandhi's uh, story is there as well. But uh, I'd love to hear it from your perspective. No, uh, you know, I mean, there was, uh, of course, legal segregation, and uh, the hierarchy was that of you know, whites have all the privileges and the bulk of the privileges so for whites, and then you had Indians and coloreds uh, placed in the second, third rank, second and third rank followed by uh, people of African descent. And so that's how it worked. You know, people of African descent um, were given the dregs and people in between white and black were the colored and, and the Indian. And that's where Indians fit in. And of course, you know, Indians were comparatively and Indians and coloreds were comparat comparatively better off than say um, uh, black people. Uh, by and large, but they were also subjected to the same kind of racial segregation. They had to live in separate uh, neighborhoods. Uh, they could not get the job opportunities um, that 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 you know white people had, and so it was you know awful segregation. And in places you know um, when you, if you were uh, actively engaged in 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 political activism against the state, you would pay the price of either being tortured or being detained or thrown into jail. And uh, so a number of, of, of Indians and coloreds realize that the long-term future is to identify with black people mm. and that the political struggle of Muslims, uh, especially after uh, nine, uh, you know, 1976, where there were the Soweto uprisings, where the youth in South Africa took the leadership uh, of liberation into their own hands, began to target apartheid schools, and began to say that the future lies with the youth. 
and really radicalizing the struggle, it's at that point that the large numbers of people of Muslim background, ethnically Muslims are either, were either classified as Indian or, or, or colored slash Malay, a, a small number of Muslims of African heritage, and a very, very small number of Muslims of, of kind of Caucasian heritage, uh, many of those Muslims began to identify strongly with the liberation movement. There were, of course, those Muslims who, who kept on holding on to a certain kind of outdated theology to say, you know, Muslims are living in this country and they must obey the law of the land and they should not rock the boat and, you know, the advantages in this country, uh, so long as, you know, the regime allows you to build mosques and pray, uh, you're okay, why are you challenging the, uh, the, the status quo? So when people like myself and Dr. Munir and others, when we returned from the Indian subcontinent um, as young theologians, uh, we, in, at, at least I want to claim that my generation in particular, and there were no, a number of us, we were just not an isolated few, um, really in a very concerted way began to articulate what I would call a Muslim theology of liberation. Myself, people like uh, Farid Isaac, um, Rashid Omar, um, Sheikh Omar Khabir, Hassan Solomon, whole number of people began to articulate a, a theology of, of liberation uh, where questions of justice, uh, race, and gender were kind of the priority issues that we were, we were engaged with. Now, I remember reading, I think, and, and I know we're jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves, but uh, when, when you return and you are at the University of Cape Town, I believe, uh, you, you had some problems, right? I mean, this is right before you coming to the United States. Yeah, but but uh, yeah, I mean that was that was you know right towards 1998. But prior to that, uh, when I returned uh, to South Africa, I, I, I my return to South Africa from India was via London, where I spent some time studying and working as a journalist. Then back to South Africa, working as a journalist. Then I went to lead a national Muslim organization called the Muslim Youth Movement. And uh, after that, I decided to go to do graduate work at University of Cape Town and finishing, or at least fa after fast, uh, finishing my master's degree, I was hired at the university and that, that took me onto a, a very kind of different trajectory in terms of my service and that uh, I did about 10 years of that uh, before I had the uh, misfortune of being a target of uh, urban Muslim uh, terrorists. Uh, who targeted my home, but I was not the only one targeted. Uh, prior to that, 50 odd bombs were um, deployed at, at the homes of of, uh, of people that this uh, Muslim uh, group did not like. The, 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 the acronym was People Against Gangsters and Drugs, and they bombed and killed people, and I was lucky to have survived. Uh, my house was bombed, and me and my, my family and I were lucky to escape unhurt. Wow. Wow, that's 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 hair raising. Yeah, uh, you know, I think I misspoke earlier when I said de facto segregation. Yeah, I meant legal segregation. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, now, going back a little bit, when you mentioned about sort of your own sp spiritual awakening and what leads you to, you know, the, uh, to um, study at a seminary or various seminaries in India, um, how did that go about? And, and what age were you? And 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 then, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I, I came from a kind of, you know, middle of the road um, merchant, merchant class family. Uh, religion is important, but religion was not the kind of major preoccupation of everyone. The major preoccupation was to, you know, how do we keep the business going? How do we pay the bills? And, you know, how, 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 do, how, do, how do we get prosperity? Uh, my father had six, six uh, kids to take care of, so he was working night and day in his, in his store. Uh, my mother had a sense of religiosity, and she was always the kind of the, the one who kindled the kind of religious component, the moral values, as she kept on instilling that uh, in, 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 in me and, and, and my siblings. And um, I was very much kind of interested in dabbling with electronic things, and I wanted to become an electronic engineer, and those were some of the things that I was hoping that I would, I would, I would do. Um, I was dreaming of, uh, you know, uh, the stuff at the time you had, you know, Apollo missions, uh, you know, going up in, in, in space. So I was really excited by, by those developments. And, but one day at school, I was confronted by a, a fellow student, a Jehovah's Witness, who raised all kinds of questions about Islam and, and talked about Islam being a false religion. And that set me thinking and really, un, you know, unmoored me in terms of, you know, 
how can this be said about my faith? And that sent me down into a major uh, kind of passion of inquiry about what Islam is. And of course, I, I could not get the answers, uh, you know, ready at hand. Uh, the more I was reading books, I, you know, the books, you know, gave some answers, but left many answers and, un, un, uh, uh, you know, uh, many questions unanswered. Um, I then realized that what I really need to do is to know what this thing called Islam is. And the only way I could know this but is to is to go to institutions where I can learn this well. So I had no idea that it will take so long, but now it will take about six years to know what this scholarly tradition is. And even though it was suggested to me that I should go to a secular university called University of Durban Westville, uh, where they had the program in the study of Islam, I said, are you out of your mind uh, to, the, to the people who told me that you know, I should do that? I said, no, I want to go and study Islam at the feet of the real authentic folks, and that is I want to study at really orthodox institutions. I had no clue of what orthodox institution was all about. I was, I, I was clueless about the challenges that they were posed, but it was just a passion because I was told that that's where you're going to be able, where you're going to find uh, the skills to learn Arabic, to learn Urdu, to know the tradition in all its complexity. That's where you're going to go find it. And so, you know, I happily, as a, as an 18 year old, just you know, completely unfazed by the challenges of life, and said, you know, get me a ticket, and I'm going to go to India. And I went uh, to India with with the Tablir movement and spent some time with them. Got oriented to the kind of the Indian landscape. And then made my way through one, two, three madrasas in order to find the kind of uh, get the kind of fine tuning as to which place would suit me best. And so that's how I got to that. So in, in, in a nutshell, you can say it's a question of identity. I think I think when I think about the developments and the kind of challenges that contemporary young folks who are heading off to Syria and want to join radical groups, um, I mean, I, I understand why, what, what's going on. They are worried about the world in which they are living. They are genuinely concerned about their place and the place of their community in the world. Now, you know, luckily for me, uh, in 1975, um, there was no major kind of global Islamic event happening in which I could be sucked in, okay? So there was not like, you know, if, if I was around and thinking about this in 1979 where the Iranian revolution happened, or just after that, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, I could have been sucked into a major maelstrom of Islamic activism, okay? But I went, I was lucky that in 75, things were fairly calm. I mean, you had the, you know, King Faisal before that had called the Arab oil, oil boycott and, you know, put Israel under pressure, put the international powers under pressure. So th that was the scene. But uh, uh, there was nowhere that I could join any kind of Islamic movement. So my passion was, I want to make an inquiry what this thing called Islam is. It was not, it was not which movement do I join to win a war against evil or against the Americans or against the Europeans, whatever the case may be. It was about who am I, what am I, and how am I, am I going to navigate this world through the question of knowledge? I wish that half of those folks who are trying to leave America's shores and Europe's shores to go to uh, Syria ask the question, the same question that I ask, who are you and what are you and how do you know yourself? That's not a question that they're asking, in my view. Well, I mean, just just to just to pick up on what what you were just talking about. I mean, can you can you connect the dots from from there to to now in terms of uh, you know the the work that you're you're actively doing now and and uh, um, in terms of the writing that you've been pursuing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I never thought that I would be a, an academic um, when once I once I got to to India. So it's but one of the things I I did know or I did strive and did dream of in the same way that I dreamt of being an astronaut or a pilot or sitting behind you know a a, a complex set of apparatuses that I wanted to play around because I was fascinated as a kid with that. I was also working as a newspaper seller. Uh, it might be a surprise for your audiences that once upon a time, 
people stood with a bunch of newspapers under their hands, uh, under their arms, and selling newspapers on street. <laughs> so I worked for my father, right. and, and I used to sell newspapers. And when I didn't have clientele, I would read those newspapers. So that's how I, I became familiar with the news. And when I saw these writings on the page, I kept on saying to myself, you know, someday I would like to write myself. You know, I would like to write. I would like to write for the newspaper. So no wonder that I ended up becoming a journalist at some stage. But all throughout my career in India, I, I, this idea of writing and knowing and learning about the world and, and, and making those connections were important. So on the one hand, I'm in India studying where these antique texts that I write about in this book called What is the Madrasa, texts that date back to the 8th and 9th and 10th centuries and even up to the 18th centuries about classical uh, Arabic grammar, about literary figures and their poetry, about legal texts, about Islamic law, theology, and all kinds of stuff, the whole nine, as they would say. On the other hand, I'm living in a world in, you know, that where the Iranian revolution had happened. Um, the world is a different place when I, when I got to India. You know, once I got to India, the world around me started changing that landscape, Afghanistan, the Soviet invasion, Iran, lots of energy now. And now I had to figure out, okay, I came to study this kind of benign Islam, and now I'm seeing that there's another face of Islam, which is political Islam. So I do have my flirtation with political Islam as a, as a, as a student. I think most people go through that phase. Uh, but for me, the political Islam was about, okay, what is the relevance of Islam to the lives of Muslims? And I was always thinking about South Africa, my destination that I returned to, and apartheid and racism out there. And so now I'm beginning to question what I'm studying, and I'm questioning the relevance of what I'm studying. So now I'm, I'm exposed to the classical heritage, but I'm also asking new questions of this classical heritage. And I was lucky enough to find some people there who encouraged me to do some secular studies. So I started uh, you know, taking a, a courses at Kanpur University through correspondence, You're studying English literature, political science, economics. And now I started putting you know, both this, my secular learning and my kind of religious learning together reading now authors like Maududi and Sayyid Qutb and others who are talking about Islam in the world. Uh, people like Khomeini becomes an inspiration for my generation. And so now one is thinking about changing the world. And, and so and when I left... What happened? And this was Islamic journalism. A man by the name of Muhammad Fatih Uthman uh, was a, um, a, a leading scholar, Egyptian scholar who was working in Saudi Arabia. I met him at a conference. I might have made some impact on him. He became the editor of a journal called Arabia, the Islamic World Review, uh, kind of aspiring to become the equivalent of Time Newsweek magazine for, for, for Muslim communities. He invited me to join the team of Arabia in London. And so, you know, there I was going to go into London. Uh, left India. I said to myself that, Everything that I've learned in the madrasas, you know, I, I, I more or less know what it is, but I didn't get the picture of what I was learning. I couldn't understand where all this was taking. And I was kind of despondent about the learning that I acquired in the madrasas. I said that, you know, I, I didn't know where this was going to take me, what the destination was. But the kind of stuff that Maududi and Khomeini and Sayyid Qutb, with the kind of things they were saying, that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, yeah, have an state, grappling with, yeah, have an Islamic order, have an Islamic political order in which Muslims will have a role. That was tremendously exciting and empowering. Okay, and so I set off to London with those kinds of ideas in 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 my head. I'm going to write as and now joining, um, you know, the uh, promising magazine called Arabia, the Islamic World Review where I met Dr. Muhammad Fatih Usman a couple of months prior to my joining his team in, um, in the new magazine in London, I was fairly disenchanted with the madrasa tradition. I felt that it taught me a lot of things, but it did not put things together in the big picture. And at that stage of my life, uh, the new kind of Islamic literacy that I had adopted was the ideas of political Islam thinking about how, what kind of role does Islam play in the world, uh, Muslims, you know, having an, a vision of Islamic states. Um, Iran was the kind of the big um, moment uh, for my generation. And also the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan 
had, you know, caused a number of setbacks for Muslims. And so all those kinds of issues were with the baggage that I carried as I go to London. And when I get to London, I obviously discover that, you know, political Islam doesn't have all the answers either. So that period as a journalist is now beginning to learn about the world. So as I'm getting exposed to the world outside of the confines of a very kind of narrow madrasa education, my horizons expand uh, for family and other reasons. I go back to South Africa, continue as a journalist. And really, when I get to South Africa, I begin to question all the stuff of political Islam that I learned because I realized that political Islam was giving me a very narrow vision of the world. The world in which I was going to be flourishing and living in is South Africa. We have we have you know, a Muslims are a minority, there's a majority of people of other faiths, a question of justice for that society, where we have to collaborate with believers and unbelievers and atheists and agnostics and men and women. Nothing in political Islam equips me for that. It is at that moment and somewhere between my London phase and my South Africa phase that I read this uh, a publication, a book by a guy called Fazl Rahman called Islam. And as I read this book, I say to myself, wow, this guy knows everything that I know, but he can put it together. In other words, here he seems to have the kind of detailed knowledge of the Islamic tradition, but he also understands the logic and the story behind it. And that's how I become a, a, a kind of a student of Fazl Rahman. Never studied with him formally, but I voraciously read his work. And I suddenly find that now there's a resonance and now I can begin looking back at the stuff that I learned and I now redeploy those stuff. So both the political work in, Islam, uh, in South Africa, you know, pushes me to go back onto what I've learned and now to retool myself to deal with some of those issues. And as I was working as an activist, I realized some of my, de my deficits. And my deficits were that I know a lot of Islam, but I don't know how to interpret the Islam for the world I'm living. And so therefore I realized I need to go to university to go now do an advanced degree uh, that will both empower me uh, how to articulate the stuff that I know in Islam, but also learn other tools and other skills, such as the study of religion, political theory, language philosophies, and all those kind of stuff. And that became, I guess, my, my big moment where I realized that my calling was in scholarship. And that's where the ideas of wanting to write for a larger audience, to be an activist at the same time, to be an academic, uh, and do all those kind of things in a, in a kind of a, a multitude of ways, in a multitude of forums, and become a kind of a public intellectual, that's what happens to me in South Africa. And I think it's that kind of work that then gets uh, attention elsewhere. So I increasingly get, get invitations to come to the United States, to, to, to speak at conferences and so on, and then of course, the kind of uh, safety and security risk that I faced in South Africa after uh, the attack on my house in 1998 resulted in some people um, at Stanford University, where I spent a semester prior to that event, uh, invited me back. And so I spent three years as a visiting professor at Stanford University. And as I was about to go back to South Africa, someone uh, by the name of Bruce Lawrence called from Duke University and said, we have an opening out here, would like to join there. And that's how I, you know, that um, going to Duke then became from, a, you know, a three-year sojourn in the United States has now become a lifetime. So, um, so connecting so, that, that, connecting those dots are important, and I would like right. to talk more about those dots. I, exactly. I was just going to say we've gone really far down that trajectory, but I'm glad you sort of finished the whole, you know, or I guess give the listeners a little bit of a preview as to what uh, some of the stuff that we want to still sort of unpack with you. Um, you know, you bring up so many. You brought up so many things that I that I that I was just sort of responding to. Uh, one, it's interesting, and these things have sort of happened almost accidentally. You know, you mentioned Dr. Fatih Osman, uh, who later on goes on to become, you know, a, a figure. Uh, at the Islamic Center of Southern California, uh, maybe one of the f sort of pioneers of that mosque, of that community. And, and, you know, we've had guests on who grew up in that community. So it's interesting when I said accidentally how these things have come together, where we didn't even know there were connections between some of our guests, and here you go. So, you know, that, that connection was made by way of uh, Fatih Osman. Uh, and then with some, with, with some of the other points you were talking about with regards to taking now your classical training and and then being able to translate that to 
what was happening in the world. You know, these were, it reminded me of some of the conversations that we had with Dr. Sherman Jackson, in which, you know, he, you know when he's talking about Islam and, and the problem of black suffering, that's kind of precisely what he's attempting to do, right? Which is to, you know, uh, offer uh, by way of Muslim theology, you know, what does Muslim theology say about the problem of, you know, theodicy and black suffering and so on. So uh, very kind of, it made me think about, or, or it made me think of that when you were talking about some of the uh, despondency you felt after graduating from seminary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I yeah. wanted to go back real quick though, Dr. Musa, sorry, before you, uh, you know, because we, you know, I want to I want to talk about your book. What is a madrasa? And I think that would be a good segue if we could to not only talk about your book, but also to kind of go back to your days in seminary. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, arriving in India and you and again, for the listeners, I highly recommend uh, a very not only readable, accessible, but also a, a very substantive book, which is what Dr. You know, Dr. Musa's most latest book, which is what is a madrasa? Um, you know, gets into some of this stuff and really it's, you know, t is a sort of a biographical uh, journey through your experiences on a, almost a day to day level, uh, you know, attending a seminary. But when you get to India and, you know, we have the various strains of Islamic thought in India, you've got the Ferengi Mahal and you've got uh, the, the uh, Tablighi Jamaat and you've got Deoband and you've got Nadwatul Ulama. What leads you to finally choose Nadwatul Ulama and why? So um, I'm going to answer your, your, your last question uh, first, but I want yeah. to go back to, you know, my kind of larger project. And if Please. I don't, I hope you'll remind me. So, you know, as I'm, as I'm navigating the various madrasas in India, I realized that um, after making a, a, a two-month trip back to South Africa in my third year, I realized that the exposure of Islamic learning that I'm getting here is, is, is very narrow. And that is not going to prepare me for the world in which I'm going to be serving. So I very quickly realized that most of the madrasas are narrow. That happened within a three-year period. My romanticism with the madrasas get crushed as I see what, is, what are the limitations of the madrasa tradition. Now I need to find the madrasa in South Asia and, and in India in particular that's going, to add, it's going to at least give me the kind of minimal kind of exposure and qualification. And Nadwatul Ulama, because it is not ultra-Orthodox, it is open to the idea that it's open to the notions of contemporary Islamic thinking. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis in understanding Arabic and Arabic being the access language for contemporary uh, Islamic literature. So that was attractive to me at the time. I said, you know, if anything, I, I benefit from spending six years in India to know the Arabic language well, because that's a key tool to unlocking the kind of classical uh, heritage as well as the modern uh, Arab Muslim experience. And, and, and also I went to a big city where I was exposed to, you know, the British Library, to other kinds of intellectual influences. So that, that's what made Nadwa attractive. And Nadwa was not, you know, spending, putting too much emphasis on, you know, what kind of clothes you wear and how long your beard should be. And, you know, on, on the kind of paraphernalia that places like Deoban and others very much insisted on the kind of regimentation. So when I get back after my uh, two month uh, trip back to South Africa, I come back in almost in the act of defiance to Deoban campus with the jeans and the T-shirt. OK, which, I is kind of that book. which is which is kind of unheard of. But I was now in a defiant mood and I was now saying to myself, OK, I'm going to I'm going to choose the battles that I want to fight. I'm not going to now let the institutions tell me what to do. So in some ways, I became a rebel within the madrasas. And the, the place that could, could accommodate my rebelliousness in some way was Nadwatul Ulama, Nadwatul Ulama uh, to some extent. Um, and, and, and so, you know, my, my, my engagement with the madrasas is a kind of a, uh, a, a hate-love relationship, more love than hate. Uh, hate-love is kind of a bad experience. But I, I see both strengths and weaknesses in it. So one of my friends recently, I went to London, and he's telling me, you know, all the madrasas in, in, in Pakistan should be shut down. And I told him, are you out of your mind? I mean, are you, are you, do you want to kill the religion of the poor people? I mean, what do the, the millions and millions of poor in South Asia, if anything they have, they have faith. And it is these madrasas that produce very inadequately equipped clerics that give sermons, that teach their children, that bury their dead, who marry their young, and do all this kind of functionaries. 
And this friend of mine who's sitting in London, uh, and he's a big writer and so on, just feels that can be shut down. I said, you know, that's precisely the mistake that people like you and the leadership of, of, of governments in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and, and elite Muslim leaders are making all over the world in thinking that they can just wish something, wish something away. What is your alternative? What is your alternative? The alternatives to madrasa education has produced, you know, Islamic universities in, 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 in Pakistan, in Malaysia, and in parts of Africa, but they really cannot really come to the level of, uh, you know, equipping people to deal with the classical tradition. They, very few can. And so um, there's inadequacy, and, and, and madrasas at least address the question of authenticity to some extent, even though I think authenticity is overrated and authenticity needs to be, needs to be, needs to be addressed and to be queried and interrogated. Uh, but it's absolutely vital that we think about the madrasas as a resource to improving Islamic education. So why am I obsessed with Islamic orthodoxy and why did I write the book about the madrasas? I wrote the book about the madrasas because the madrasas are receiving kind of bad press in the American in American and, and Western media because of the link with the Taliban. And whatever the Taliban does, it seems that it's attributed to all madrasas. And so I'm saying it's not all madrasas, it's some madrasas. So someone read the book, who read my book and recently said something that I didn't say much about, you know, Madrasa Hafsa and the Red Mosque in Pakistan. I did mention it, but I didn't go into any kind of detail. Well, those are the madrasas that are the problem madrasas and one cannot run away from them. Right. Um, but that is not what this book is about to tell you what are the bad madrasas. I think the, I want to talk about the madrasa as an intellectual tradition and what can be salvaged from that intellectual tradition. And I'm seeing, saying that my experience and my example could be a way in which that classical and the salvageable part of the madrasa tradition can enter into a conversation for a new kind of epistemological shift in the way we understand Islam by using the best of contemporary instruments of, of learning and, 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 and modalities and disciplines of learning from, from the humanities to the social sciences to even the, 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 the natural sciences, bring it into a kind of genuine conversation so that we can have a discourse in Islam that is relevant to the contemporary Muslim experience. Because most of those classical texts gives hands down ideas and concept and beliefs and values that are that are not part of a contemporary Muslim lived experience. It's an archival experience. And unfortunately, some kinds of and some forms of Muslim orthodoxy believe that only that past experience is the panacea and the answer to contemporary Muslim to Muslim to Muslim challenges, which is how can you how can you give me the experience of someone who's never understood the cosmos that you and I understand, who don't understand gender the way I understand, how can their, how can their teachings be of absolute in, you know, value to us today? They can inform us about the past, but our solutions today come from our experiences. And we have to make that discovery in the same way that they made those discoveries. So what, what is the value of studying the Islamic past? The value of studying the Islamic past is to see how people reached their own conclusions and how their experiences, experiences gelled into a, a, a discursive tradition. And that becomes a model of how we need to uh, found, find our own recipe to deal with our discursive tradition. And I know you might have questions, but let me just say this, that um, I think the crisis of contemporary Islam today is because we have an, a, a, an orthodoxy that is not intelligible. We have an unintelligible Islamic orthodoxy. So orthodoxy comes with a huge amount of attraction with its authenticity, but in, its intelligibility right. is, is questionable. And so what I'm talking, and that's why I'm obsessed with this tradition because I studied there, I can see its values, but what I'm saying that we need to find an intelligible orthodoxy and the absence of an intelligible Islamic orthodoxy is driving people into the hands of, of, of people who think they are orthodox, but actually in the, in, in the arms of the crazies. That is this kind of hyper zealous Salafis 
That's who right. grow their beards and wear dresses that have a slit in on both sides and put a toothpick in, the, you know, a big toothpick in their mouths. And they say, you know, we are authentic representatives of the prophet. Uh, and, 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 and they don't think anything about killing fellow human beings, let alone killing, you know, fellow Muslims and, and everybody else. And so I think that that is the crisis of contemporary Islam. The, there's no destination of where you have intelligibility and a certain kind of authenticity. In your view, I mean, that's fascinating, Dr. Musa. In your view, what leads to that or what has led to that unintelligible, unintelligent orthodoxy? I mean, we can't blame it all or put it all on the doorstep of, uh, of colonialism. No, no, no. I, I, I think this, uh, it's, 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 it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, of course. So I, so I, will, I, will, I will give it a stab. I don't think I have all the answers. I think it's, it starts before colonialism. It starts, so, so let, let's talk about contemporary orthodoxy that I know, that I know best, okay? Okay. That is the South Asian uh, uh, orthodoxy, but also Middle Eastern orthodoxy. Middle Eastern orthodoxy is, is Muslim orthodoxy, is slightly different. Because yes. there are different kind of currents uh, there. But so, for instance, for most, for South Asian orthodoxy, um, there's a massive motorcycle going past my house. So I hope that that does not um, uh, I- impact on our sound. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, Indiana and the Harley Davidsons, yeah. <laughs> okay, Indiana and Harley Davidsons, exactly. I'm, I'm not in a soundproof place. So let me, let, in case you want to cut this, let me just say for orthodoxy, South Asian orthodoxy that I know best, for instance, for them, following a law school and opting out of a law school is all makes all the difference whether you're part of the Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, in other words, whether you are part of what we call the Sunni tradition. If you do not belong to one of the four law schools, you are out of legitimate Sunnism. Can you imagine that? You're out of legitimate Sunnism. Now, in just by not prescribing, just by not subscribing to a particular madhab, as we madhab, would say, right? exactly. Yeah, now, right. Now, okay. at least at Al Azhar, at Al Azhar, in 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 Egypt, they would not be that hard. So, so it depends. If you are an Orthodox uh, professor at Al Azhar, you will be on the same page as the Diobandis and Barelvis of South Asia. If you are slightly reformer, so if you are a Qaradawi, if you are Sheikh Qaradawi you will not push those people who study, uh, you know, outside of the law schools, or maybe adopt a certain kind of Salafism. If you follow Sheikh Yusuf al-Khardawi, who is the kind of, kind of a rock star uh, cleric of Al Jazeera, or used to be at Al Jazeera, he's got quite a lot of influence. He doesn't take such a hard at- attitude. So he will include you within, within a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, ambit of Sunnism. I'm just talking about the Sunnis. I'm not you know, trying to exclude uh, Shia communities, but it's basically what that's a topic at hand. Right. And so, so that just shows you a certain kind of narrowness, a certain kind of narrowness. So you can well imagine when Dioban celebrates its 100 year anniversary, they do not invite South Asian Ahlul Hadith, and they don't invite the Jamaat Islami, which is the kind of revivalist group, because they say that those folks do not fit in to the banner of Sunnism. Right. And so just, again, just for the, for, for the a point of clarity for our listeners, uh, subcontinent Ahl al-Hadith would be the equivalent of, uh, say, the Salafis of the Middle East. Okay. Uh, just right. to say they don't prescribe exactly. to, yeah, they don't subscribe to a particular school uh, and so law on. School, and then, a particular kind of right. law school and interpretation. Exactly. Right, right. So that's what South Asian, South Asian Ahl al-Hadith, people of Hadith, are equivalent of Salafis. Um, they do not prescribe to a particular law school. They believe that is almost uh, a, 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 an, an unacceptable form of imitation to follow one law school. And they say you rather have to follow the authority of the Quran and the Hadith as your main sources and not the opinions of scholars of the past. And so they make what, that kind of requirement. I think what some have termed, I think, and I would argue maybe even rightfully, uh, a sort of a Protestant Islam. A Protestant Islam and, and also one that they want to, uh, the unfortunate situation is that the Salafis, despite the kind of methodology that they've adopted, they also un, are also unable to produce an Islam that is relevant to Muslim experience. They're unable to do so. 
Exactly, so they also, because they going also back just to, live, they, yeah. they're also just living from those yellow pages of the past. That's right, because going back to what you were saying about, you know, if you don't if you don't belong to a particular law school, you wouldn't be welcomed or you'd be shunned at, at some seminaries in India. Well, you'd be welcomed with open arms at the, uh, you know, at the university in Medina, for example. Right. Right. Exactly. But, but but that's not to say that the University of Medina or the scholarship that it produces is, is not equally problematic. Exactly. And, and so the, 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 when you go to Medina or with, even when you go to Al Azhar and so on, right. you, are, you are not going to study um, you know, side by side with interpretation of the Quran, the contemporary theories of interpretation, how does one understand a text, what is the relationship between psychology and history and textual interpretation. Those debates you're not going to get. You're just going to get very orthodox debates on the interpretation of what Ghazali, Ibn Rush, if you're lucky to get Ibn Rush and Ibn Khaldun into your curriculum, what right. they said, uh, and, 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 and that's going to be the fair uh, to go. So my, my, my kind of content, my kind of agenda is to really work on uh, ways in which one could you know, <laughs> provoke certain kinds of Muslim orthodoxy to begin thinking creatively of how does one kickstart the Islamic tradition and how to create a robust intellectual tradition within those circles where it matters most. It's great, it's great to have produced scholarship at Duke or at Notre Dame or at Harvard, another university in America, that American Muslims will hopefully benefit from and Muslim communities here will profit from. But it's another matter when Muslim communities in the United States are looking for authenticity and want to have, you know, mass leaders and they want to send their kids to Egypt and they want to send them to, 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 to Morocco and to the Middle East and to South Asia. And they think that's where authenticity lies. And when those people come back, they bring the problems of, that we are hopefully trying to address here, just recycling old problems into our communities in North America. And, and so you're not making any progress. And therefore, I think North American communities need to be, Muslim communities in North America need to be particularly vigilant as to what kind of intellectual horizons are they inviting into their mosques, into their Sunday schools, and into, their, into, the, into Islamic intelligentsia. Uh, I, and I right. would warn them not to be very careful and have at least a modicum of literacy to unpack what's going on. Right, right. And, I, and I'm glad you, so, so you, you brought the conversation back to our shores here. Um, if I could then, you know, ask for your uh, opinion on some of the projects that you see happening right here in the United States. So, for example, right here in the Bay Area, where Zaki and I are, and where you spent some time, you know, you have Zaytuna College, right, which certainly doesn't endeavor to be a, a, a seminary, but, you know, uh, it's a liberal arts college, and I know you've spoken here. Um, what, are, what are some of your thoughts on some of the, not, not, not only Zaytuna in particular, but just maybe some of the other things that you're familiar with that, that are going on here in the United States? Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, it, it's a good idea that American Muslims are beginning to think about producing their own intelligentsia, okay, uh, and especially religious intelligentsia. And I think that's what Zaytuna is endeavoring to do. Um, it, it, those are, there are beginnings um, that, and you know, I'm very supportive of their initiative. But I'm also encouraging, you know, and I spoke there, and my goal was to start a conversation to say that. You're just not going to survive by reading translations of Tahawi and think that, you know, and, and have reading classical texts and thinking that, okay, that is going to make the big change. If you really want to study the Muslim humanities and to make the Muslim humanities, which I, I consider a vast, you know, amount of material in the Islamic past, what constitute the humanities, you have to bring it to conversation with the contemporary humanities. That's how the translation takes place and that's how the relevance takes place. Otherwise, it's just another kind of sophisticated form of Orientalism, that you're studying the past and you, you know, looking at in, in kind of in very attractive ways and you can say, oh my gosh, you know, Muslims thought about this and thought about that, or oh, we were first with that and second with that. Right. So you're just gonna do in this kind of, you know, navel gazing, that you're not going to engage in producing relevant knowledge. You're not going to be relevant. And who's going to produce the relevant knowledge? The crazies. <laughs> so the longer, the longer the people who believe that they are 
you know, they have a responsibility to, to produce learning. The longer they take uh, in, 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 in realizing what kind of product they have to produce, the longer you keep the field open for the crazies who have instant solutions. Now, the solutions that I'm proposing or the kind of solution that Zaytuna hopes to produce it takes time, it takes yeah. experience, it takes a, a, a certain um, a amount of effort and labor to figure it out. But I think one, one must be very clear about one thing, that you, can, you cannot despise the present. You, you have no reason to despise the present to cite Baudelaire. Baudelaire was his, Baudelaire was his great French thinker who mm -hmm. said you've got no reason to despise the present. This despising the present, I think, is a major, is a major shortcoming in all brands of Islamic orthodoxies. And the reason is that they don't have the tools to deal with, with, with contemporary uh, Islamic, uh, with contemporary, contemporary, with modern thought. So there's two ways to say, you know, saying, no, we already have it, it's better in the Islamic past. Or they are disenchanted with modernity, and this disenchanted with modernity makes them throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. It's so, this, this, so, right. Like the despising of the present coupling, exactly. coupled with romanticizing the past. R romanticizing the past. Which is just a, a yeah, a, a, a cocktail a recipe, of... A recipe for disaster. Right, right. It's a, and it's a cocktail, that has, <laughs> it's a cocktail that has not produced any good results. Exactly. And, and you're not experimenting with anything different. So it's a process of experimentation. I mean, I mean if you look at the history of... You know, the great American universities, Harvard and Yale and other places, they started off as divinity schools, but they, gave, they then opened themselves up to the possibilities that they are today the reservoirs of the world's knowledge in the sciences, in the social sciences, humanities, in the natural sciences. It's because it, there was a spirit of openness to learning and to knowledge. Once you start checking off knowledge as good knowledge and bad knowledge and what is Islamic knowledge and not Islamic knowledge, then you are, you are already in trouble. We've experimented in my phase of, you know, of flirting with political Islam. We were also enchanted with kind of Islamization of knowledge that turned out to be a fairly narrow identity project. And so I think knowledge must be knowledge and Muslims must learn to swim in all the knowledges of the world and, and with that, they must also engage their religious tradition with the knowledge of the present. It's you no know, you're saying, no, no, we're only going to figure out the political science with the knowledge of the present. But how do you put the political science separate from, in a separate room from the understanding of the theology of the present? So what is right. governance today? Okay. And mm -hmm. what is the role of God and what is the role of justice? And it cannot be Ibn Sina's notion of justice because Ibn Sina's justice is long, Ibn Sina thought about justice in an empire, in a very different cosmology from justice in a nation state in which I am living, called That's, the United States. Right. Okay? That notion of justice, and in a society where we foster and aspire for egalitarianism, egalitarianism, no kind of divisions between believers and unbelievers, that's a very different world. It's a different kind of justice that I need out here. That's so right. Ibn Sina enters the conversation to give me some kind of kickstart, but I don't end with Ibn Sina, I end in another place. Absolutely. And, I, and I'd be remiss because, I mean, I, I think a lot of what you're talking about also reminds me about conversations that, that you start or have in, 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 your, in your book on Ghazali and the poetics of imagination. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that as well, because I think it would be remiss not to mention that book of yours. And, and the idea of the, which, I, which was just fascinating to me when I read it, uh, the idea of the Dihlis, right? Yeah, so, so, you know, that book of mine, uh, the, uh, Ghazali and the Poetics of Imagination, was precisely this, that I, in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm a critical traditionalist. In other words, the tradition is important, but tradition does not, call, it does not have the last shot. And I have to engage my tradition critically. So that's what I would call critical traditionalism. And, and, and I found an exemplar, exemplar in Ghazali who was both kind of a heavyweight of the Islamic tradition, but he was not closed off to the knowledge of, of his present, which was philosophy. And while he did, you know, uh, you know uh, take a jab at philosophy or some philosophers on some doctrines, he was totally, you know, enamored by philosophy himself. So some of his students even said that, you know, our master, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, uh, swallowed all of philosophy and tried to then 
uh, you know, e emitted, but you know, he could not, he could not get it out of his system. It's precisely because he saw value in it. Right. And so, for me, I'm in that sense, I'm a Ghazalian in the best sense of the world, not a Ghazalian in the kind of, you know, kind of blockhead version of, version of of Ghazali. You know, everything Ghazali says is right, or I'm not going to challenge anything anything Ghazali says. I think that Ghazali made some made some cardinal mistakes too that. I would talk on another occasion, but you know, especially he, I think he went overboard in criticizing the philosophers and you know and charging them with with, with, with blasphemy and right. that, is, that created a certain kind of attitude towards philosophy and the, hence the lack of intelligibility uh, within our tradition. Uh, but not, it's not it's not Ghazali's uh, not Ghazali's fault, but other people did not did not think about intelligibility in the way that he thought about it. So in that book, I find there's an exemplar in Ghazali. Now Ghazali stands at, this, stands at this intermediate space, the Dehlis. In other words, Dehlis is that space in, in Persian homes between the house proper and the door outside. And Ghazali stands on that intermediate space where he takes the, takes the breezes from both sides. <laughs> he, takes, he takes the remedies from both sides. And he's saying, you know what? I need to, I need to, create the new the, the new kind of alchemy the alchemy happens within my soul and will come out of my out, out of my experience and I, and I and I'm fond of using the analogy of the, the story of the bee in the Quran the Quran says you know um, your Lord inspired the bee and told the bee to go make a home in every trellis in every tree and every mountain and then instructed the bee to go around in, in various orchards and from there work humbly in the path of their Lord and then comes out of the belly of the bee mm -hmm. a beverage with multiple hues and multiple colors, okay? Mm -hmm. That's precisely, that's precisely, I think, the task of the contemporary Muslim intellectual, the contemporary Muslim who's interested in living in the world as it is, not in the world as you want to dream about, but you can make the world, you can reshape the world with your ambitions, but start from the world as it is, and that's what I see what Ghazali teaches us, is that you need to take the, the various knowledges of your time and engage it with your faith tradition, your faith tradition, and remake this faith tradition um, uh, with its established values that will remain in its place, but it will reinterpret it differently. The moment I talk like this, people say, but what about all the established principles? What about the thawabi? What about the pillars of, or the foundational pillars? I said, of course, the foundational pillars will remain the same, right? But they will be recalibrated. They, they they will be subject to new kinds of category interpretations. In other words, you will still have, you know, what you see as fundamental epistemological values, but they will be painted in different colors. There will be different kinds of engravings on it. They'll be packaged slightly differently uh, from the way it was packaged in, in in the past. But that will still be people who come down from the previous centuries, if they're intelligible enough, they will be able to recognize what they had, what they had done. And some things they will not recognize and they say, you did a good job in, in, in not, not, not doing the things that we did before because it's not relevant to your society. Mm. Uh, I, I, know, I know we're uh, getting close to the, uh, to, the, to the close mark uh, here, but I, before, I leave, before we leave, I think it would be, uh, if you could, uh, I know you've talked about Fazl Rahman, um, you know, you work, or you finish his book on Islamic reform. Um, how did that happen? I know you talked about, you know, being fascinated with his writings, but I mean, that seemed, the fact that you were called upon to finish his work, I mean, that seems much more of a formal engagement uh, that you have with him or had with right, him. Right, so b between, uh, um, Again, sorry, sorry, real quick, before you get into it, I'm sorry, just for the sake of our audience, uh, Fazl Rahman, uh, just, I mean, I, you know, enough can't be said about him, but he was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, prior to that, he was, at, he was in Karachi, he was, you know, in, 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 in Pakistan, uh, just a leading Muslim intellectual. I mean, again, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Musa, to talk perhaps more about him, but I just wanted to say a little bit, um, uh, you know, about him before I, before I let you continue. No, no, you, you've adequately introduced him. So he, as I told you that he was a kind of major inspiration uh, in, in helping me out and think through issues that I thought about very narrowly and helped me to, to have a new appreciation for the classical tradition uh, and uh, with some amount of intelligibility. So uh, when I was in, in 1990, 91, I was visiting University of Chicago uh, as a trying to do research for my dissertation that, that I 
uh, was preparing to submit to the University of at the University of Cape Town. Fazal Rahman already passed on. I only met him once. Mm. I, um, I, I, when I visited the United States, I spent about two hours at his home and we, we talked about a whole number of things and I had a couple of phone call conversations with him uh, uh, during that, after that period. So mm. at the University of Chicago, the director of the Middle East Studies Center, John Wood, said, you know, here is Fazal Rahman's, you know, um, you know, last book that he was, was writing. Uh, many of these things were, were kind of photocopied. Uh, some of these things were transcribed by his children that he dictated, and here's the stuff. See what you what what sense you can make out of it. So I took it with me to South Africa, and I didn't look at it for several years, until for about eight years in 1998 when I come back to the United States. I bring this manuscript back with me, and uh, I um, at the university at Stanford University I begin to work on it, and I begin to and I finish it up there. So that's how. I, I got hold of that, you know, revival and reform, a study of Islamic fundamentalism. Fazal Rahman, you know, revisit some of the things that he talked about in his many, many articles and publications. Um, and he re revisits some of those debates. He shows that he's kind of in love uh, with Ibn Taymiyyah. He also likes Ghazali. He's particularly enamored by the idea of the centrality of scripture and the Quran in particular. Right. Uh, he thinks that a, a modern... Muslim um, uh, kind of solution would have to make the Quran to be a centerpiece. Um, uh, in that way, he takes the Iqbal's agenda, Muhammad Iqbal, who was the poet philosopher of pre-partition India, uh, but who's buried in Lahore in, in, in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, Iqbal, who's seen as the spiritual father of, of, of Pakistan. Uh, yeah, Iqbal also had a similar idea. And so uh, Fazal Rahman's you know, book, uh, where he, he engages, he wants to engage in the critique of fundamentalism because he thinks that fundamentalism is a very, very much a narrowing of, of an, an, an understanding of Islam, particularly a very narrow interpretation of the scripture. And so in that book, he wants to show that the varieties of Muslim thinking in the past from mystical thinking to, to more kind of orthodox thinking um, have both pluses and minuses. And, and he thinks that if only Muslims can re-familiarize themselves with the classical past, that they might be able to then choose and select a set of, of intellectual registers that could help them navigate the road forward. Of course, he did not get the chance to complete the book. I did not have the courage to say, you know, you know this is the way I, I think Fazal Rahman should have concluded the book. So I left the book as it was. I, I left it to his readers right. uh, to think about, you know, the conclusion. I'm hoping that in one, one or other form of writing of my own, that I would possibly, you know, think about uh, the things that Fazal Rahman might have said or re-engage him, re-engage him again. Uh, and therefore, in a kind of a, uh, my next project is about between right and wrong, debating Muslim ethics. In, in that book, I possibly want to engage with some of Fazal Rahman's ideas again. Well, I think that's, uh, unfortunately, we, we're, at, we're running out of time, but that's actually a perfect place to put a pin in it because we'll obviously, we'll definitely want to have you back on when you uh, talk about, obviously, the, the future uh, work that you have coming up. So uh, on behalf of Pervez and myself, and thank you so much for, for chatting with us. I know that we have, we have plenty more questions, so I, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get to have you back, hopefully. Thank you for having me, and I, I, I truly enjoyed our conversation. Thank Dr. You Musa, much. where can our listeners uh, find your writings? Uh, I know you have a website. Uh, if you, uh, I don't know if you are on social media, if that becomes a good resource for people to find you. Yeah, so um, uh, your listeners can find me on IbrahimMusa.com. They can find me on Academia.edu. Uh, they can also Ibrahim Musa, um, uh, at at, at, at my Twitter account is at Ibrahim Musa, and also on the Notre Dame on the Notre Dame uh, you know website uh, of Contending Modernities and the Kroc Institute and the Kiel School of Global Affairs, uh, and also on Facebook. Um, so I'm on I'm on I'm on multiple media, but Twitter 
and Facebook and my, my website are the places that That's I'd right. be more than happy to engage uh, your readers. Uh, uh, not your readers, a lot of your listeners. Do you still keep uh, up with the? Do you still keep up with running? You still find time to do that? <laughs> I know you were an up, avid runner for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've just picked up. I just picked up uh, my running after Ramadan. Ramadan was like really brutal, yeah. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, and, and I think I, I was. I was. Um, I, I guess we are off air now, right? No, no, we're we're still. <laughs> we're still... <laughs> Oh, you're still recording. But I, I, anyway, I, I, you can share the story. Baby. <laughs> no, uh, Ramadan was brutal in so far that I think I was I was incubating some kind of thing, and, oh, and right. so I I, I I I I did manage to fast most of most of Ramadan. But uh, after Ramadan, I've just begun to pick up, and I've been you know I need I need to run a half a marathon sometime uh, before before December, so. I need to put on the miles. <laughs> oh, right, right. Well, wonderful. Uh, yeah, that was. Do you run, do you run too? I'm a runner, yeah, and and I in fact I, it was my goal to do a half marathon right before I turned 40. So I did a half marathon last November, uh, oh, wow. but that was really the last run I've done. So it's been a while. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Meaning last formal run. I run every day, but you know okay. last formal run. Uh, but Dr. Musa, again, thank you so much uh, for our listeners. Uh, you know, uh, both of the books that we mentioned of Dr. Musa's, what is a madrasa, as well as his text on Ghazali, are available on Amazon. At, uh, available at your uh, brick and mortar uh, bookstores as well, I imagine. So again, Dr. Musa, it was a pleasure. Uh, look forward to having you back on again. All right, thank you guys. Well, that was an illuminating conversation, Pervez. That's right. You know, it's funny. I, I, I think of our shows as sort of fitting into various buckets, right? I mean, and, and you can file this with, like, the conversations we've had in the past with, like, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Munir Farid, perhaps to a slightly lesser degree. But certainly, I think our episode and our interview with Dr. Jackson uh, kind of reminded me a lot of that, um, where Zucky kind of disappears for about half the show. But he's still there. He's listening. I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so <laughs> that's right. So anyway, yeah, it was a great it was great talking with Dr. Musa. Uh, I really, uh, you know, I, again, I said it on the show, but uh, uh, or I'll say it again on the show that, uh, you know, it'd be great. I think for those of you who want to read a very accessible piece of uh, uh, or a very accessible book that talks about the madrasa system, kind of looking at it from within or, or, or really takes you inside of a Muslim seminary and what really goes on. Um, as opposed to what you hear on like Fox News or whatever, um, you know, it's a really good book. So I'd really encourage uh, the like the audience to check it out. It's called What is a Madrasa by uh, Professor Musa. Definitely check that out. Well, with that, uh, where can people find us online? So we are at uh, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. Please uh, write us on our Facebook page. We always do take the time to respond back. Of course, you can always email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Uh, and, of course, you can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio. Uh, please leave us a star rating and a review. That would be great. Uh, you can find Zucky online at? I am at zuckyscorner.com. That's the A-K-I-S corner. And also at the Huffington Post, where you can see my movie reviews regularly. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at Zucky's Corner, and I'm wherever you are looking for me. You will find me. I'm That's all right. around you. <laughs> Something that we mentioned at the outset of the show is, you know, we are, as you have uh, have, have seen, uh, that we we are trying to do the show uh, or make it into a a, 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 a what bi-weekly, uh, sorry, bi-monthly. Yeah, uh, show and so um, you know we hope that uh, we can continue to bring you guests that you want to talk to and listen and and and, and listen to. And with that, uh, that wraps up this episode. We'll see you in two weeks, hopefully. Thanks for listening.